back in the, <coughs> in the old billiard room. It's uh, three years to the day, strangely enough, that we were sitting here and we started to make your super tape billiards at home with JK. You know, saying that, firstly, I couldn't believe it when you said three years because no, no, no. Uh, well, it just doesn't seem possible. And what is more, tremendous coincidence. I mean, this was totally, you know, suddenly happened, felt like doing it. And it is to the very, very day. day. Yes. It's quite unbelievable, yes, isn't it? Yes, yes. So, I mean, that's nothing like that's that. been planned at all. So, I think there might be a message there. Well, I hope so, <laughs> because uh, we're going to do some more, <coughs> more work on the game. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's hope it goes well. I didn't uh, think that um, when we made the last one, I mean, and I know you won't mind me saying, but you're coming up to your 80th birthday now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I can't believe it, and I'm sure all the other people that know you can't. Your enthusiasm and, and fortunately wonderful health, I mean, you just continue to play. And I suppose in a way, um, I mean, obviously everybody's limited by talent, but I mean, you were given a lot of it, but. Is there anybody really who's ever had the time to spend on the game and the health to allow them to go on for as long as you have? I don't know. I, I can, I suppose, I could truthfully say in my time. I mean, I knew Joe, I knew Willie Smith, I knew Walter Lindrum, Horace Lindrum, Tom Newman, of course, who was my mentor. Yes. And I mean, they were players. Um, particularly until Horace came, who was perhaps deeper into snooker than billiards, but a very, very good, a thousand break player, mind you. But the the others were, they were such wonderful billiard players. Yes. I mean, and it, it's a great pity that uh, they didn't have the facilities in those days to do what we're doing oh, now. What we're doing because here now. Uh, their skills were such that I doubt if we will ever achieve the sort of things they did. Um, not entirely because people haven't got the uh, the skills. They've got a degree of skills, but they haven't got the need for it. There is so much more entertainment in the world today. I mean, in those days, um, to go to Thurston's or one of the big halls where they were playing money matches <coughs> was... It, although they were matches, it was a form of entertainment, yes. but yeah. particularly billiards. Yes. I can remember coming out of one hall and uh, Walter Lindrum had been playing, I think it was uh, Tom, and Tom was quite a long way behind. And I came out and of course agreed Tom, who lived very close to us, almost next door to one another. And I turned to my father, and I was only a young lad, around about, I don't know, nine, ten years of age, and I said, isn't he a wonderful player? And this was Tom, and Tom was about 4,000 behind. Yes. Now you see, so there was no, there was no thought who's of who's going to no, win. No, no, no. And you sit back and you admire the wonderful shots and the wonderful play, but of course today, it's all about competitiveness. Yes. And, you know, it isn't always the best players that win, which is a sad thing to say, but it's a fact. Yes, they had longer, of course, to play, didn't they? They had week and two week matches and they, yeah, were, yeah. they had time to develop the skill and show the skill. But um, now I think um, <clears throat> that you want to do something else with regard to putting another tape together, which I thought the last one would be the one, but um, amazingly, you're going to do another one, and I hope that's not going to be the last now, because you've had an enormous response to billiards at home from well, around the world, haven't yeah, you? Yes, surprisingly, yeah, I'm very surprised. I mean, um, I didn't, I haven't pushed with the thing. I did it purely of love of, of the game, and you know, if it's going to help somebody on the way, so be it. But um, the response has been quite remarkable. I, I never thought I'd be. Uh, replying to Australia, New Zealand, Africa, uh, all over the place, I mean, all over Mar Europe. I think it's marvellous. Uh, it is, it's, it's very nice, and um, the pattern of, of the 
uh, response has been the same. It's what a lovely game, what a wonderful game. You know, this is what is a bit sickening, actually. It's a wonderful yes. game, but... And people don't see it. And they, they don't get a chance to see it. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, there are lots of things one could say about that, but perhaps for less than better. <laughs> But a lot of the um, <coughs> letters you've shown me, um, and I think you've talked to a lot of these people that, that um, phone you to send a tape and you've put little personal messages on the That's tape. Right, yeah. But after they've seen them, there seems probably from the better players this, this great interest in top of the table, which um, we did a considerable amount of, but you feel there's much more detail to go into with this tape and it's really the top of the table play that you want to really get into, isn't it? Yeah, well, it, you know, there are lots of things I would like to say, but, you know, I don't want to be seen to be setting myself up. But I must say that I've had people come to see me and we talked about the game. I've had very nice letters and things. And, you know, the pattern is generally the same, not only from uh, sort of mediocre run-of-the-mill club players who play quite a pleasant game but from very good players indeed and they've they all say the same thing well you know how do you do it you know um, <laughs> it looks so and it does look easy it looks easy when you see it yes. and yet like anything really done at a very yeah. high level it makes it but easy. suddenly somebody you put you set the balls up for them and, and uh, within a minute or ten shots or they've lost the run of the balls and uh, they really don't know and when you watch it it's very easy for me to say and I do say occasionally well you know you're not playing it the correct way no. now when we say the correct way it's not that you're uh, half an inch out I suppose if you're if you're au fait with uh, measurements uh, you'd be talking, well, you're a two or three thou out there. Mm. For uh, perfection. In make, terms of finding easy. the line, yes. you know. And this is why you see this bit of tape on the table here. You know, I was taught the game by Tom Newman, who was a wonderful player. And his theory was that you never played, you didn't play the shot. He used to shock you and say, well, what are you going to play? And you say, well, well, I'm going to go in off that ball. I say, well, why going off? Uh, well, you say, well, the ball, you've got to hit that ball there, and it goes off there into the... He said, yes, so you're thinking about going there and going there, thinking about the pocket, the ball, the cue, and everything. He said, don't do that. Just, do you see the line from the, from the cue to the object ball? You say, yes, from there to there. He said, well, play that. If you get that right, the rest happens. So, instead of playing the shot, yeah. you play the line. Which kept the pressure off. That's right, exactly. <clears throat> Not only that, you could tend to concentrate on your cue delivery yes, just, looking, just looking at the object ball and let the rest happen. Yes. Now, where the cue ball goes will tell you exactly if you understand what, is, what you've done wrong. So the, the, and this is Tom talking, not me. The balls will tell you what you've done wrong. Yes. Now, you know, you'll find most players who struggle with top of the table, uh, you get the person who feels good for 20, 30 points and, and uh, thinks, well, you know, why can't I make 130 or whatever. Yeah, uh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and the reason is that you have to play the shots that appear to be easy. You have to play them in a different fashion. You have to know exactly to separate the, the line that appears to be correct and play it with the side of whatever nature which alters the line. So therefore you're playing a different line from the line that... Making all these little allowances. That's and right. Yes, and, with uh, it's, it's far easier to demonstrate it and show rather yes. than talk about it. Talking is easy. This is why when you get to this stage, this is where you find the, the uh, men from the boys. Yes. You know, talk's cheap, but you, when you're there, 
you've got to show it and prove it. Because if you're talking to a very good player and you say, well, look, um, you shouldn't have broken down there because you played the shot. You played the right sort of shot, but you played it incorrectly. Yes, and this really is where, I mean, you've often said to me that you don't have to be a, a, a champion to be a good coach, but you have to be a champion to be a top coach. Yeah. At the, at the sort of level that we're going to be exactly. talking about yeah. now. Yeah. Yes. And I that's... mean, you're a golfer. I mean, um, I could say you are a very good golfer. Now, I mean, I have spoken to a, a top professional golfer. And when you talk to them and they begin to say, well, now get that finger down there and just press on the thumb there, just just turn that wrist just a, no, a little bit more, you know, you begin to think, oh, come on. But this is what it, this is what this is all yes. about. Yes. It's how you hold the butt, how you lengthen the amount of cue over the butt, how you there's more push and pull rather than pull and push. You know. And this is all building up to working you into a state of mind that gives you perfect coordination because you're not playing with one ball like a tennis ball or even a golf ball, ball with no. great respect. Yeah, no, no, no. You're talking about controlling the direction and the pace and the bounce off cushions of three balls in one, one shot. One shot yeah. And I'm <coughs> telling you, you've got to know what you're doing. One of the um, interesting things is obviously a bit of water's gone under the bridge since we made the last tape, but of course I see on the table here this visit that you've got the yellow, red and white, the yeah. new billiard balls. Do, do you find it difficult to cue the yellow? I mean, I'm a little bit old-fashioned. Not I really. I don't know whether I could uh, really... I, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I, I think I would sooner stick to the original English two whites and a red, a spot and a plane. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, it's English billiards. We ought to be keeping what is English, you know, I mean, we're getting almost to pool now. I mean, we've tried big spots and more spots. Yes, and, that's right. And that is off-putting. I mean, you can tolerate this, yes. But on the other hand... I can't see the point in it personally, but... Well, of course, it's for television. <laughs> and I mean, you know, television. I mean, I've had, what, 20 odd years in uh, television commentary and so on. Um, and I know that you have to cater for television, but unfortunately, television, uh, in many respects, is the ruination of, of the spirit of the game. Because yes. everything has to be made and projected for the box so that the audience, the public, could sit down and, and get some enjoyment yes. from it. I mean, one of the other problems. <clears throat> with regard to the snooker being so powerful is that um, when I've been to the professional billiard matches with you a few years ago and you were playing them on the tables they play the snooker championships yeah. on um, I mean again I don't, I don't agree with but they don't have any undercut and it might be very good for potting but you lose the lovely long jennies and coming off the cushion entrances with, with spin and 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 then the nap's another thing, isn't it? I mean they've shaved the nap off so that it doesn't have so much effect when they're playing snooker. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I, I do agree with you to to some extent with the pockets, but I fully agree with you on the cloth. Now the cloth today, due to the snooker players, uh, and let's face it, when, when players become champions and uh, they realise that uh, the less nap that you have, uh, you get less uh, problem with various types of shots with using size. Oh yes, more than anything. Uh, you get the ball <coughs> drifting, uh, pushing off and all that sort of thing. And they have uh, asked the authorities to let's have less nap, less nap because it makes potting easier, which of course it does. And if you want to see the reflection of that, you, you see the youngsters today, and I mean I've seen plenty of youngsters, 
they pop like bilio. I mean, they knock balls in from everywhere. But they're not what you call good snooker players, but they're tremendous potters. Yes. And, and snooker is becoming a potting game. But don't misunderstand me, it's always been a potting game. But, yes, but there's <clears throat> a great deal of the subtlety has gone out of it. And I think it's very sad. And of course for billiards, I mean, the, all the, the mystique and the, and the skills of billiards are being able to use nap. Yes. To give you a variety of ways of getting one shot. Shot. Yes. This is. I mean, this is really where uh, I feel that where snooker was played on a billiard table, I now feel that you're all having to play billiards on a on snooker, snooker table. table that's which right. um, is a shame, but there you are. So, how are you going to go about um, this top of the table? On the tape. Well, Roger, it's that. one thing showing people the shots, and you know, it's uh, it's very uh, well. I wouldn't say easy, but it, it's well within the capabilities of a few good players to show you shots, play shots that they like playing, which they can they can achieve. But it's another thing telling them how to do it, and where they're going wrong. And I can tell you that the, the general uh, gist of letters and, and phone calls and queries I've had are the, to do with technique. And, you know, it's very difficult because I feel personally, I can't speak for other people who coach, but I feel that People are so enthusiastic, young people, they want to get on and they want to, they want to play. And if you start talking to them about do this, do that, do the other, and then, you know, practice, they, they get a bit bored with yes. it. They want to get, get on, on too play. quick. You know, they, they're not so prepared to serve apprenticeships. No, and everything and happens today, they're right. so young and they... they but the problem is members. that when, when they start, they, they go to in a club or whatever and they meet somebody who plays a good old game, billiards or snooker, and he does a lot of things that are quite wrong, uh, and they copy, and if they go to the best player and say, well, how do you do this? And they say, that's right, do this, you know, and it might be totally wrong. Now, but they get a certain success, but when they get to a point where they can think for themselves and they suddenly become more ambitious, then they want to do some of the things they've seen a professional do or whatever. And then the habits they've created, okay. it's like trying to give up smoking. Mm. You can't break the habits. No. And, and if you start correctly... Then you can build. You can build on yes. it. Yes, yes. And the, the, the thing that people tend to do, and I could tell you some very, very good players, I'm talking about top-class players, who tend to copy unwittingly what they see another professional whom they admire on the television yes. doing something which is okay for him but not for them but they tend by watching to drift into that little habit and it isn't for them no. and they're not aware of it and then if they have that for a few months and then they think well you know I'm not getting any better and in a, in a moment of peak they say oh I'm going to go and have a bit of coaching. I've got, you know, something wrong. Something's wrong. And, you know, you sort it out for them, and uh, they find it so difficult. Once, well, once you got into bad habits, yeah, it's so much exactly. more difficult to get into good habits. So what I want to do, I, I have found that people have said, well, I don't feel so comfortable at the table, and I've always, uh, through the old timers, but you know, when you get down in the, in the basic position. There is a little locking of the body, and people do find a problem in finding how to, to put the pressure on one leg or the other, or sit on the hip, and these little things. And it is so simple, but they, they, put, they add things to it which they shouldn't even think yeah, about. And it's got to be automatic when yeah. you start doing things at top That's of the table. Right. You yeah. see a good player, if, if you watch a good player, he will step into the shot, and because he's an expert, 
he steps in and he's down and he's there. Now, if it's like everything, you learn to walk before you can run. Now, if you start slowly and you put your feet in the right place, the accepted place, and then you've got three or four little motions where you do this, that, down, and if you do it correctly, you suddenly find, oh, you're in the right position. Yes. Now, if if you feel that you've got, you might be a freak, you've got one leg much longer than the other, or shorter, you know, yes. everybody's different. Yes. You, you have to use your common sense and make certain adjustments. Yes. And in the end, you find that the, the top range of players are all playing to the basic principles and they're applying themselves near to that as they can get. Yes. And that is style. Yes, that's style is nothing to do with technique. No. The technique is to be basically correct and, really, and deliver the cue. And really getting to the level we're going to get to on this tape where you're talking about the sort of things you're going to be intricacies at the top and it doesn't matter how much knowledge you've got of that unless you're delivering the cue where on the line or wherever you want to hit the ball you you're wasting your time that's right so that's when you're going to start off having a that's little right. chat about yeah. that and just the one thing roger when you talk about the line of aim to anybody now the line of aim and this is where the, the half ball knowledge is extremely important. Because if you take the half ball, that is the only other shot apart from a dead straight pot where you visually can see exactly what to do. Yes. I mean, if you put a dead straight pot up, perfect six shot into a pocket, Centre to centre. You can say say to a little boy, can you see what to do? Oh, yes, yes. That's, oh, it's dead straight. Yes. So he automatically wants to hit it straight. Now, if you move one ball, and now he's got an angle to hit, now he thinks, well, oh, I, can't, I can't really see because they're not both in line. That's... He's got to find that line to pop that ball and then play that line, not play, play the, the pot. pot. No. Because the pot's over there, but the line's over there. Yes. And this is what I just want to go into briefly, and how to stand correctly. And with great respect, I have to say this, there, in my opinion this is, you know, and everybody's entitled to their opinion, there are certain aspects of what I've seen creep into snooker players today, that I disagree with. Yeah. Uh, if I can help, I will. But if they want me to help, they have to do what I tell them. Yes. Otherwise, no. they can find it from somebody who perhaps thinks differently. Well, there's only one little last thing, and that is um, we're dressed up a bit today, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, you know, when we did the first one, the first tape, um, we said, well, we would call it JK at home. Well, obviously, when you're playing at home, uh, you don't get up in your monkey suit and uh, you, you relax like anybody else. Now, it just happens that doing this, what we're going to do here, this is only first, a short piece. The first piece. It is, you know, when you see somebody in black and white and you see their image, uh, you, you, you will only perhaps see it and concentrate on it at other times when you perhaps watching television in a match or if you happen to have a local match coming off and they're in their, their dinner suit and so on. And that is the image you create. Yes. And so I thought, well, for this, God bless them. Yes. I'll but we are still at home. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll start what I've got to do. Okay. You start what you've got to do. Well now, we'll tackle the first phase of the technique and that is that when you walk into the shot you use as much of the room that you're playing in as sensibly possible and step into the shot working very hard 
on the line of aim. So now I will do that, having to turn my back to you, and I walk into the line of aim, and there we are. Now, before I say anything else, I haven't just arrived on my bike, but for your benefit, I've tucked my trousers into my socks to give you more clarity with the position of my feet. And you will see now, if I place the cue ball approximately on the pink spot, and that gives me into a fairly average shot there of bridging at the table. So now I look right through the tape, which is the line of A. I do my little jiggle, similar to the golfer, and suddenly I say, that's lovely, that's it. Now, when I'm there, I look down, and you'll find that your right foot is standing on the line of aim, and your left foot is parallel to the line of aim, at least the width of your shoulders. It doesn't hurt to go a little wider. The more you can brace yourself, the better when you twist. Now, having done that, you then get down on the shot and prior, just before you get down rather you, you stick the cue in your tummy stick it in your belly button and you will see that your, your cue when you're standing perfectly straight both legs straight you are looking virtually at the middle pocket now stick the cue in your tongue come round and place the cue parallel to the line of aim in that fashion, there. Now, in the, from there, go down, as you go down on your left knee, bring your left arm in and extend your left arm fully, going onto the left knee, keeping the right leg stiff, and you've formed a very solid frame. And there you will see my cue is on the line of aim from tip to butt. Now, I want you to look at that very carefully because what I'm going to do now is just try and prove a point to you. Now, let us assume I've found the correct position. Now I'm up. Now what I'm going to do is you're focused on my feet and I'm going to move my left foot to an incorrect position for me and I'm going to put my foot there which isn't very much different but I've taken the width out of my straddle of feet and I'm going to get down in my normal fashion and play and try and catch an early glimpse of my line of aim there. There. Now, there we are, look. There's my line of aim. And you can see my cue is across the line of aim, but bear in mind that optically I'm looking correctly but the, the incorrect placement of my feet has taken me down into my natural position and put the cue across the line of A. Now, that is quite a big margin. That is a heck of a big margin. What we're talking about is this sort of thing. There, you're addressing the cue ball in the centre there. A plate for convenience, I put it there. Now, there you get it, there you don't. You see there, look, you see how that's moved off the line. Now, we are talking about perfection. Now, we don't achieve it all the time, I can assure you, but the point is you try to work to perfection, and the more you try, well, the greater your success. So there it is. Now look, I'm going to put my foot back to where I feel happy. 
there. Now I'm going to go down and I'm going to extend my left arm, just that little turn there which my arm forces my body into, and there we are, look. I lay the tip down. Let's have a look at that. That's not bad, is it? As opposed to that. And there it there you you miss it. There you get it. That's what we're talking about. And the more you practice that, the more you will find that you'll begin to point the cue where you're looking, and that is half the battle. Now, if we come up to my body, when I'm in this position before getting down, I've had the cue there, I've turned my body there, keeping my feet perfectly still. Now, this is the bit that really tests you. As you extend your left arm to, to put it on the line of A, that really forces your body to the right, stick your bottom to the left rather. And as you do that, arch your back, and there we are, look. Bang on the line of A. Now that is the important thing. Now if you bend your arm, and a lot of players do, they feel they want to get through the shot more, which, uh, you know, can mislead them. So they think, well, if I get closer, if I get a little closer in and get closer and bend my arm and get support on the table, that they can push through. But the point is, when they're tight up close like this, there is no tightness in the body, and this effect can happen. And particularly at snooker, uh, same at billiards, if you're playing a forcing shot, it isn't always exactly the movement, it's the vibration. It's the vibration that will... We're talking about turning that cue such a small amount and this is what you have to try and avoid now for some people they can rather than twist and go really forward they can actually sit back and sit on their hip but they tend to have a longer overhang of the cue on the bridge hand but nevertheless you can be very solid that way and there you can see, I'm in a very comfortable position. I'm sitting on my hip. And it can be a very good stance. Now, you can use either. And these are the sort of things, if you get used to the basic principles here, and this pushing of the body, sticking your bottom to the left, and forcing yourself down, arching your back, and that really locks you in there you will find that if you do put your feet in the wrong place, you might be in deep concentration, you might be in a big break, you've forgotten that there's a world around you, and suddenly you get in there and you, you're so careless that you're down, you're seeing everything beautiful, you get down, and there we are, look, straight away. But you play because you're looking correct. Please believe me. I've been doing it a long time. And don't wait till you get as old as me before you find out. So there we are. I hope that will help you. I'm sure that if you have the patience and you're keen enough to try, that it will, it will bring you some success. So now let's just have a look at uh, what I like to call the straight arm brigade, the three finest players probably that have ever lived uh, and the greatest scorers ever and here we see Tom Newman my mentor in fact who look at that beautiful parallel to the bed of the table cue a straight arm there straight and rigid as a rock 
and what a wonderful player, beautiful top of the table player. And then if we go down a little, there you see, well there you have the benefit of a left-hander and a right-hander. Walter Lindrum, the greatest scoring machine of all time, straight arm, rigid as can be, and Claude Faulkner, probably one of the most beautiful players to watch. A very debonair little man, a most beautiful player. Again, strong, straight arm. Really excellent technique. Days to remember. Now the object lesson here, what I want to do is to give you an idea of how to tackle top of the table. I mean, lots of players can play around the spot and they've got a fair idea of what to do, but there are a lot of little tricks and things which take a long, long time to learn. So if I can talk through this uh, without making any mistakes, it perhaps will give you an idea of some of the things you ought to try and adopt. Now, firstly, uh, we all know and we all say so often that uh, the game is all in the mind. Well, I'm inclined to agree with 95% of that. So therefore, you have to cultivate uh, an attitude whereby you feel confident. Now, I'm sure lots, thousands of players would be confident of making 10 points at the top of the table in this situation. Uh, that's being on the small side, of course, but now what you have to do is when you practice this top of the table, don't think in terms of, well, you hope you make 100 or 200 or whatever. Just count to, shall we say, uh, in some cases, 25. A better player in 50. Now, when you get to 50, Throw it out of your mind and start the next score, pick up two, three, or whatever it is you do. And then keep, keep a subconscious thing about how many 25s, how many 50s you've made, and you will find that this point in a break where you come a little edgy because you're doing well, and you feel, oh, this is as good as I've ever done. So therefore, there's a distraction of concentration. So bear that in mind, try and cultivate it. I'll show you what I mean. Now what I'm going to try and do is, I'm going to say we'll, we'll play up to 50 and just see how it goes. And it's a little more difficult in this case because I'm going to tell you whether I'm putting side on, which will be to redirect the red, which isn't quite as I would have liked it in terms of perfection. So I improvise. And improvisation, I can assure you, is the secret of playing good top of the table. That is in lengthy spells. And of course, if you can achieve that, of course your game will literally rock it and you will find ways of getting to the top of the table and uh, seeing if you can't play your best when the balls are close together and they are in some respects easier to handle. So here we go. Just a hint, a very slight hint of left striking. Very thick on the red. Now, just a very, very gentle, soft stun. That gives me a nice, straightish line on the red, with just enough room to get through and pop the red and give me the right angle on the two balls around the spot. Now no side, three quarter ball on the red. That gives me a nice angle on the red again. And again here, a very soft stun. Now that gives me a nice angle. If I'm too straight on the red, I'm not really, I could, there's so much I can do here, but I'll play it the way I like to play it. So now I want to lessen this gap.
between the white and the red. So I'm going to screw back on this red and I've pinched a touch of right hand side just to increase the angle of the white here of my white so that I can get underneath this white and push it nearer the spot. There we are, half an inch. Now when the red is potted with check side you will see when the red goes on the spot what a valuable shot that is because there we are right back where we started. So now again that minute touch of left hand side there. Now this time the white, I've been a bit heavy in the touch. I'm not the white or too far from the spot for what I would call good play. So I'm going to go down the table just a little further than normal there. You see I've gone down the table and I've created that nice angle there where I've come to the cushion and return the white near the spot. There we are now again, the pot red with a bit of check side. And always play that very smooth, don't snatch on that shot because check side can be dangerous. Now full on the red with left hand side to steer the red into an angled pot there. Now you see I've got a tiny angle on the red whereby I can pull it up to the line across the table, the imaginary line, there, and just above the line, you see there, look. Now all I have to do is just pop the red. And again, note the touch. The red doesn't go flying in the pocket. And the great secret of top of the table is touch. They are very, very wise words that I learned when I was about eight years of age from Tom Newman. Touch, Jack. That's what he used to say. It's the secret. Well, one of them, hint of right hand side this time. And you note the white has again gone a little bit away but not to worry at the moment because I can stun on this pot for another pot just above the line you see there's the line look now I can take another pot because the last one wasn't off the spot and just roll the red through there a good solid contact on the red puts pace into the red, the gentle striking of the cue ball. Now I'm going to play no side at all and just drop on the white. Now this time I think it's time I thought about rescuing this white, get it back towards the spot. We, we're getting that sort of distance. So I'm going to pop the red and come up here, then I've got back to this angled off the cushion. Now bottom and a bit of right hand side. There. Now you see I've gone nicely up the table. Now in this case, of course, there are times when you have to stretch on the table. If that is too much, don't be silly, take the rest. Play it on the low side, not on the high side. There's the high side, lay it on the low side. Now a nice finish red. You see that side just come back off the top cushion. And that gives me a nice angle pot there for the red to come back. There we are. And there we are, virtually back where we originally started. So now I'm going to play with right hand side and 
centre ball striking to the right, not low on the cue ball. That ensures that if I play it too gently, it will have enough turn on the ball, because I haven't dragged it in, in any way, <coughs> excuse me, and the, the, the freedom of the stroke, of the rolling of the ball, will make sure that I don't stick on that white ball. So now I've got a pot of red, and I wouldn't mind coming up for a pot here, and if I go too far, I've got a cannon. Now, you see, I've got everything on now. I mean, that was a nice little holiday shot. Now I can pop the red gently, go through to here. I can run through the red and skim the white, fetch the red back to there. I could even screw back to here. But everything, you know, again, this is how you're feeling, how, how happy you're feeling with yourself. And that is exactly what you want to do. There we are now again. Touch of right hand side. Pull up for a pot. Again, doesn't matter if you go a fraction too far. And that's about perfect. Now again, a gentle pot. Now, one more cannon, and I think we should think about rescuing that white towards the spot. So I must leave an angle on the red, so a hint of left-hand side. You see, and that's left me a very nice angle on the red. So all I have to do is strike low on the cue ball, and just stun very sweetly down the table, and there is the cannon off the cushion, hint of left hand side. And you see, you notice there, I played that very carefully because I wanted to tend to knock the object white back, back a little toward, towards the spot. It was getting a little too far this towards this way. So by clipping the white, you find as you progress with your excellence of touch and play that you can actually steer this white ball a little that way or that way by using side off the cushion. Of course, you have to be careful. It is very skillful. Make no mistake. Well, there we are. Now, I don't know how many I've scored, but I'm in perfect position. Pot the red, come up here for a pot, come out here for the cannon and get the white up to there. So this, I'm working three shots ahead and there you can see. I'd better start by end rather by doing this one there. There we are. Now I did prophesy what I would do. So just to show there's no mistakes in what I'm saying. There. There we are. So now I'm in perfect position here to play the shot going underneath, underneath there. There's the white come up there. Pop the red. And that's where we came in. Now, Lots of players will, when they're playing this top of the table, and I mean fellows that play a nice game of billiards, and they feel that, well, they can only get so far with this top of the table, and they might set this position up here, purely for practice, and find that they might, on average, get anything from 25 to 50, uh, where they can almost be sure of getting that amount of points from this position without having to go away. But that seems to be when they're really playing well. And they say, well, 
you know, it, it takes good touch and all the rest of it to maintain uh, the position so that you can go on and maybe make two or three hundreds or four hundreds, whatever you would wish. Now, let me tell you from my own experience that the thing that I think creeps into the play of that sort of player is that he has this mental attitude that he has to keep the balls in that position and therefore he tries to play too accurately. And by that I mean he tries to maintain a delicate touch on this white, which is good in one sense but can be bad in another. And by that I mean that he is too tight in his play, therefore he's not flowing because he's trying to hang on to the three ball control. Now what he should do, you've heard me mention this distance here. Now I set myself personally a task there, when I'm about that distance from the red, anywhere there, with the object Y, that I want to start getting into this position where I can come and rescue the white there. Now, this distance, of course, the greater it is, the further you have to knock this ball. So therefore, there's always the fear of you, you cover the spot or whatever, touching balls, there's all sorts of things. So what you want to do is Try and play, practice this particular shot to learn to send that red and come under there and just drop on that white enough to do that. Now, the reason I say that is because I think most players, when they play this shot, they tend to go purely for feel of the cue ball. Now, that isn't bad, of course, but what, let me tell you a little secret that I've discovered myself, which is extremely valuable, that when you've got to whatever you feel is a limit uh, and you want to make the cannon, if you play from, and you get a nice angle here, when you play the shot, is to play with top, at least above center striking so that you have a good forward rotation of the ball because that forward rotation tends to give freedom of travel but at the same time <coughs> excuse me it doesn't restrict the bounce off the cushion and you find that that ball will travel nicely to there as opposed to if you strike with dead center or below center, trying to keep control, that you will kill the pace off the cushion, off the bounce, and it will die on its way there, and you end up very tight behind the white, just short of it or whatever. So, you know, there is a little tip. And practice, just put that shot out and practice it. And find the various ways. Remember that you can kill the pace of this ball by taking the red thicker. And very often, even with the white there, if you, if you get the right angle on the red, when you, say, play from a pot here, you pot the red, and you come out here somewhere, you can take that red thick, which will allow you freedom of stroke. And by that you will put plenty of pace in the red to knock it to there and you'll find because you've hit it thick you take the pace out of the cue ball and it will literally nicely tuck up behind the wind. Now try it, practice it and once you develop the art of this recovery shot I'm telling you that is the basic shot for maintaining longer runs at the top. And don't try and make too many in practice, at least. Don't try and make too many cannons and pots, cannons and pots, cannons and pots. If you feel 
but you have to play with a wee bit more pace and tend to knock the wire there, about there. Rescue it straight away. On the other hand, sometimes it might be there, and because the angle is there from the pot, you might think, well, all I have to do is just pop the red, run through to there, and then you're faced with that shot. So play it. Don't wait for the white to get there. Even if it's there, play it. And it will build your confidence into playing the recovery stroke. Now, that, believe me, I've learned from a lot of experience, that is a very valuable tip. So try it and build confidence into your play. Well, there we are. That's a nice hint for the day. I wish you luck. Well, we'll just have a little run here at the top and see if anything crops up that uh, is interesting in the, the way things go, whether there's any uh, nice little shots that uh, you need to put in your locker, you know, when you're playing. There's always something crops up, so we'll just see how it goes. It's surprising how often when you're playing the opportunity does occur to get this sort of position and it, it, you don't have to be worried about uh, starting from that position. I mean this is purely practice which uh, will crop up in your play at some time or other. And of course the one thing that uh, makes this more difficult in some respects uh, when you're practicing is that you have to field for yourself uh, if you count as well it all helps to distract from concentration and of course the time factor in scoring as well it uh, you can't score as quickly but that isn't always a bad thing That, of course, is the ideal position when you, you get that nice angle on the red where all you have to do is pop the red and you automatically leave yourself another simple shot. That's when you can really work hard at gauging the, the touch and the control of dropping onto the object white just enough to move it without getting a cover. And that's where very often this little touch of side, according to how you approach the object white, whether you want to uh, just turn off it to avoid a cover. See there, there was a touch of right hand side on that, very slight. Don't forget the pace, pace of the red ball. That will give you an indication of how nicely you're timing and touching the, the red for pace to the pocket. Now you see I've just gone down the table a little there, just got lower on the cue ball. No extra, no extra pace in the shot.
see there, the paste was put into the red to bounce off the side cushion at the same time taking the paste out of the cue ball when it comes up underneath the white. That's something that you want to be aware of, that feel of pace. That looks nice for just coming underneath again and the white is the object white there is a nice position and care with the rest. See now there, there was a hint of left hand side on that to get the edge of the object white, to nudge it slightly towards the spot. Not a risky shot if you practice it and get used to playing it. You have to judge the side. That was played with fairly strong right hand side, kill the pace off the top cushion and put pace into the red ball with the thicker contact. There again you see thick contact on the red, check side. And again there, extra pace, thinner contact, and the white could have come a little further, but I can take the rest here and get... The red isn't going to kiss the white, so I'm all right just for a gentle run through. <laughs> If it's necessary, there we are, that's crossing the bulk line. Looks like deep screw here. And important to be sure of your shot there, not to let that white 
get too far into the center of the table. You, the angle is very important there. Check side here. See in that last shot there, I played that quite freely, being confident of getting underneath the white. And it gives you a little bit of a relaxation for a, just for a second to play a free shot. And I've just about gone to the limit there with the uh, object white. left hand side on the red. See that's cleared the white and I can just about, I've got to be careful here, I want a little bit of running side so I, must, I mustn't push into that white. Just about made it. There's a wee bit of improvisation there, going the other side of the white with right hand side. And that's put me right back in the picture now. It's amazing the times, if you practice this way, the various little shots that will crop up that are total improvisation that you can't uh, legislate for. You just begin to accept that that is how to play top of the table. And if you are able to master the feeling of the amount of side that you can use at a very gentle pace you will see how it comes to your rescue so there we are I'm going to do a sequence of these shots round up I don't know how many I've scored round about 150 to 200 and see what crops up and a variation of little shots that are helpful. And there we are, that's an ideal situation now. Next piece, the different camera angle gives you the opportunity of noting the position of the cue in the majority of shots, which is parallel to the bed of the table. Now this is very important indeed in queuing, especially around the spot end and your long losers and things like that. So just take a note. There you see I used a hint, just a hint of right hand side which would hold the white. There again the left hand side has squared me nicely on the red without any pace. And you can note in this sort of play how it becomes more repetitive. The shots have basically so far been virtually the same almost every time. And of course the more you can get into that repetitive way, so you will find that uh, the bigger breaks come along because you're not taking the risks. There we are, we've been twice in this position before in this break.
now top so I'm going to run through that you see and lift the red off again for a nice angle on the red no side involved there just a nice little stun and always try to keep the control of that cue ball keep it from wandering to the side cushion with those sort of shots close to the work that's the the motto Now again, strong left hand side here, but you wouldn't notice it being on, but I can assure you it is, and it's turned the red. And personally, I always like to keep the object white, just fractionally one side of red or the other. I don't like to have it directly behind. Left hand side again, thick on the red. And that's a perfect angle there to again, you see, come under the white. It's the same pattern all the way through. And there are times when you can maintain this for long periods, and this is what pushes the big brakes in. And needless to say, the key shot here it always is keeping that object white. Close up to the red with the cannon that uh, I'm going to play now and that is the shot to master this one here now then you see now there the angle was a fraction off and I've put a little more pace to come off the side cushion and you balance the pace with the thick contact on the red to get slower contact off the red with the cue ball and there we are in perfect position. Now there I'm taking a hint of right hand side, you could see that. And that's just to take any life out of the cue ball. You know, if you had the left hand side on there, you'd find the balls would be spread apart. And the art of putting that side on is not to give it too much wrist. Uh, you only put the wrist in when you really want to get some fluency into the shot, to get what I call sizzle rather than side. And very often, of course, you, you do need it. But generally speaking, the less you have to use it, the better. Try to be aware of the, the pace of the stroke. You rarely see the red go flying into the pocket. 
uh, as long as it gets there with enough weight just to overcome any slight deficiencies in the cloth or whatever, any tiny wrinkles or finger marks that uh, the ball will travel over. That's enough. The less you have to hit them hard, the better. You see there, I meant to come off now. Again, I, I've a little bit shorter pace there. I wanted to be further off the cushion. And as a consequence, I've paid the penalty by having to take a thin shot, allow the pace in the cue ball. It's got to happen. And consequently, I've got to be very aware now of pace. I've got to get the pace right. And that's where the concentration was. So I've got myself out of trouble there. And every break you play, every little break you put together, if you're doing this sort of thing to find out how you're getting on, every break will produce different shots, different emotions, and this is what you, this is the sort of practice you want to, well, I was going to say get, don't ever get fed up with, but uh, if you love the game, this is as fascinating as you can possibly get at this game. Now here, I'm much too straight. Now I can come off the white, but I've got to be dead right on the red. And I'm not, you see. I wanted to go further, in this case, and then come back off the red to the white. And I would be in perfect position. But there isn't the angle. So I've, I should have to go away here. Now I'm thinking about it there. No, it's risky. I can't take the risk, so I've got to go back to ball. So we'll see how this goes. And what is more, I can't pot the red. Well, I could, but it would be all over the place. So I've got to go in off the red, but there is a way out. A nice gentle in off. Now, and here's a little tip that you can use very often. Play the drop cannon, but play to miss on the side that you approach the ball, that is from the further side of the white ball as it is there. And just gently come off the cushion underneath the white. And this, I can assure you, this is quite a standard shot if you are aware of it. Play to miss the white on the inside and judge the pace. There we are, now what about that? And that isn't a difficult shot. Just good concentration and pop the red. And there we are. Now I've got to go on the other side of the white here, so that's left hand side. Now I've got a bit of a bounce on there, so I've got a slight cover. Up goes the butt. Tiny little swerve. Never use force with that sort of shot. Allow the ball to work on the nap of the cloth. It takes a lot of self-control. Now, a simple shot here. Played with care, judge your pace nicely. There you are, and we're virtually in perfect position. Well, there you are now that now it looks as though I shall need the long rest here so I suggest we leave it there and what a time now to be able to pot the red with a long rest stay there and go in off 369 and a little bit of red well there you are and what a time to go away and that surely is 
a very good tactical move and I would like to see some of the young pros trying to get a little more of that attitude into their play rather than wanting to stay at the top forever. The thing is to, when you can go away like that, when you've, you've perhaps struggled, I struggled slightly there, and you're able to uh, suddenly get yourself into a position where you think, well, they're not going 100%. I'll just drop that red in, 369, and who knows, you may make 30, 30 40 points, eight, maybe 10. But the point is, you break it up, you, you get revitalized, as Tom Newman used to say in the old days, have a little holiday and you come back totally refreshed and what a time for your opponent. He's, he sat and watched you maneuver the balls around with a, a fair amount of skill and suddenly when you had every opportunity to continue you go away, you just cool down a little bit with one or two losing shots and then you go back again and start again. It's devastating. So there we are. I'll call that a day and have a cup of tea and see what I can dream up next. So in the meantime, get on the table and practice. Well now so far it's been fairly obvious that control of the object white can be maintained by bouncing it off the top cushion gently up behind the red or from the side cushion in various ways. Now, this time what I'd like to try and show you is how tight you can keep the object white behind the red without using the cushions at all and it demands that delicate touch and this is really what you want to strive for. So here we go now, I'll concentrate hard and just see if I can do it.
Well, there you are. We are virtually back where we started. And that's a nice few little points put together. And you will find that if you, if you practice that, it, to keep very tight control of the white ball, it will build perhaps a little more tension in your play. And that's a good thing. You get used to continuity of play. Now, what I've done, I've put a nice break together uh, uh, quite a bit longer than that and to give you a, a perhaps something to think about I've put some commentary on top of it and just see if you agree with my comments and the choice of shots that I've made so there we are the there's the way to start at the top. Sorry about the little break there, but that's the problem with one camera. So here we go now. I won't bother to count, but just see how long we go for, and if I can help you with uh, just talking about little points there to uh, keep the position going, keeping that white reasonably close to that red, similar position as long as possible. And of course one has to take into account the unseen thing which is touch. And you can, you can base the touch really on the, the strength on the red ball the, of its entry to the pocket. Faster or slower will give a really good indication. bearing in mind that little touches of side will alter the normal direction of the red and you have to use that uh, to advantage and that is basically the improvisation of playing at the top of the table. Now here you see I want to get underneath that white. Not quite ready for it so try and do it the next time I get on the other side of the table so now that is the the purpose now you see I've left a simple pot that allow me to go further down the table so I put a little bit of bottom on the ball and it's quite a delicate touch and now I can get underneath the white and return it towards the spot. And that is the basic principle of floating white. Looks easy, but I can, well, you probably do appreciate that uh, it takes quite a lot of practice. The amount of stun here. There you see I struck the ball just below centre. Hold the cue ball and just put a little bit of screw on it. Under the white. You notice there, there was quite a fair amount of check side. So always be careful when you're potting the red because a slight miscuing there and you can uh, put too much side on and miss the pot as easy as it looks. And you, the more you play this, the more you will appreciate that you develop your own, your own feeling and fancy for the, the distance that you like to play with the white behind the red. Personally, I, I've always tried to maintain about three inches from the red spot. 
You see, now that is perfect. Now when that white begins to get up too far away, then you really think about the rescue. And you'll find the more efficient you become at getting behind the white, the tighter you can keep that distance. You see, now we're getting towards the limit, for me anyway. So now, feeling good, I've, instead of playing this side of the table for the pot, and then go to where I am now, I've actually gone straight there in one. And you have to be careful if you do play that. Now further down the table, so I've got to control the pace of the white and be very careful. And the pace that you can play, the, the delicate pace of really letting the cue white float all the time, the more you play, the more you practice, even though at times you're disappointed, the more you do it, the more you become acquainted and it shows in your play. You become acquainted with the touch and touch. You can't improve touch by not playing, put it that way. See, I was just a, a mite heavy in the touch on that uh, cannon, and I've really got to get that white back now. And by staying closer to the red when I've screwed back, not going too far away, I've made the angle correct for coming underneath it. And there, you see, I've managed to play with the opposite side and skim the white. And whilst it's a good shot, it's not one that you want to have to play too often. back to normal, plenty of check side. You see it, I've pinched a little bit of angle there. I used a touch of left hand side to get that white further down the table to give me the angle to get underneath the, uh, the white off the red. And again, this is not the best of shots to have to play with the rest. Touch becomes a little more difficult. <laughs> 